Welcome to Online Off Script, where we discuss trending topics and all things new on the internet. I'm Eliza Philo, Digital Ads Senior Coordinator. I'm Flynn Zaker, CEO of Online Optimism. This week, we're talking about advertising a college experience, connecting with a younger demographic, and the CBS hit show Survivor. Our guest today is Owen Knight, Director of Admissions Marketing and Communications at Tulane University. He was also a contestant on Survivor 43, where he made it to the final three. Hi, Owen. Thanks for joining us. How are you? I'm great. Thank you all for having me. It's, uh, it was a fun surprise to get the email, the invitation, but I'm happy to be here. Yeah, we're super excited to have you on. And I think just so we can give the people who are listening an idea of who you are, who, what you do, why you're on the podcast, do you just give us a brief introduction to who you are and what you do? Yeah. So I am the Director of Communications and Marketing at the Tulane University Admission Office. So I've spent my whole career there. I went to Tulane for an undergrad like Flynn, and I've been in the office since 2014. So this is my 10th admission cycle. I used to focus mostly on social media, but now I oversee all of our marketing and comms. So print, email, social still, video, all sorts of things, and trying to creatively think of new ways to engage students, which has been a super fun challenge for me as well. Thanks. That's about you- 30 different hats you wear. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot of hats. It keeps me busy for sure. <laughs> I was gonna ask when you graduated, did you know you were like, I want to stay at Tulane, or did you? Just I kind did. Of okay. No, I did. I, I was a tour guide during undergrad, and I thought this would be a great first job. You know, if you work out of college, a lot of times you can get a master's paid for things of that nature. I was not ready to leave New Orleans, and I loved Tulane. I loved my experience as a student. At the time of my life, I got a great education. I met cool people. And so I thought it was a natural next step. Did I think I would be in the office for 10 years? Probably (laughs) not, but I've really fallen in love with the work. I love working with young people. I think the projects I've been able to to work on have kept it interesting and fun for me as well. And it's it's been a great choice for me. I don't know if I'll be here forever, but I I really enjoy it. And it's it's a fun challenge every day. We'll invite you back at the 20 year point just to say, yeah, there we go. (laughs) Do you, do you still, are you still able to walk backwards and talk? That was always the most incredible (laughs) thing. I haven't done it in a little bit, but I think I could probably pull it off. I did have to give a tour a few years ago when the new coaching staff came in for the football team. I ended up giving them a tour. So I had to break out my tennis shoes and walk backwards (laughs) and I didn't run into anything. So I think it's still in the muscle memory somewhere. That's good. They probably yeah. would have been the best, though, at lifting you up. That's what they do at every place. Exactly. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Giving me tips on how to position my hips and whatnot, you know, get me motivated. Yeah. What is your, for your current job, not the tour guide job, what is your favorite part about what you're doing today and working with such a young demographic? Yeah. I think working in college admissions specifically is really fun because the students you're mostly interfacing with are juniors or seniors in high school, right? So they're <laughs> 16, 17, 18. They're not obviously college age quite yet, but they're right on the cusp. And so they're able to have adult conversations, talk about their goals and aspirations. You're not teaching them how to tie their shoes, but they are at this kind of weird crossroads in their life where they are looking for a little guidance. So I think it's this nice duality of being a resource and being helpful and being someone that they can come to for advice, but you don't feel like you're babying them. So I I think I really enjoy that dynamic where it feels like a trusted older sibling or something like the power dynamics are not super intimidating. I don't think even though admissions in and of itself is an intimidating process, something I think our office does really well is trying to make it approachable and fun and not as scary as it can be for some other places. Yeah, I've always whenever I've seen my alumni to land social media, it's just such a personal attitude and it's y'all do a really good job of making people who might not have lived in new orleans and been on campus feel like they would be welcomed which of course they would but it's another thing to actually make that message felt on social media thank you i i really appreciate that because because obviously tulane would not be the same institution that it is without new orleans being part of it and since both of y'all have deep experience with new orleans you know what a communal warm special place this is. And we, we try to convey that visually through storytelling and and convincing people to come visit. Because honestly, it's it's one thing to just put it in an email and try to create the copy and the visuals that illustrate the story. But as soon, if we know we can get someone to visit campus and visit New Orleans, like that does a ton for us in terms of their likelihood of coming to school here. And it's it's a hard city to say no to. 
And even if people don't like it, that's honestly a good sign too. Because if, if you turn your nose up at New Orleans, like this certainly is not the school for you. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be a rough four years. Yeah, it would. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, so my best friend went to Tulane and I really wanted to go and I didn't get in. <sighs> but I, actually, I had never visited until I was in college and I visited her and I was like, oh my God, I love New Orleans. I love Tulane too. I want to move down here. And I did. And you've been at Tulane for so long. So I'm wondering what some of your favorite memories or experiences just working at Tulane have been. Yeah. I mean, golly, I, the first time I visited New Orleans, I was 12. And I remember the first meal I ever ate was at Camellia Grill. And I don't know if you ever encountered Marvin, who passed away a few years ago, but he was kind of a legendary figure there. And I just remember he made me feel so cool for finishing all my food. You know, he was known for giving everyone a fist bump at the at the bar there. And it just was so much friendlier and warmer than where I grew up. Like, not that the the D.C. area is an unfriendly place, but like it is a little bit more fast paced and transactional. And who do you know? Who do you work for? Whereas in New Orleans, you know, the the lady at the grocery store who says, you know, hey, baby, how's your day going? Like, you know, she really means it. And it's it really it just infiltrates every interaction you have. I think it helps our students stay relaxed and grounded and not as caught up in the, the rat race that college can turn into sometimes and kind of the cutthroat atmosphere of an academic environment. I think that's something that we really try to convey to students is that this is a collaborative place. This is a collaborative city. It isn't kind of this jockeying for position that they may be used to from high school. Um, So, I mean, some of my favorite days in New Orleans have been running in the Bulls, Po' Boy Fest, going to Saints games, just taking in the city and being around people and just feeling kind of that warm energy that that is just pervasive throughout the city. And you just, you know, it's 70 degrees out and sunny and you're listening to a band and you're walking around and you just feel like you know, everything feels right. And it's it's a super cool place to live. Yeah, I love that you mentioned like running the Bulls and Saints games. It's all community-based. I think that's always been one of the major differentiators with like New Orleans is every other city like DC or New York or any of them, like you say, what's the best part of the city? And a lot of times it's like a building or a thing or a restaurant. <laughs> and when you ask people in New Orleans, like what's their favorite thing? Every, every answer Despite the food and drinks and everything, like entertainment being world class, the answers are always like people facing. Mm-hmm. It's the opportunities and experiences you get from meeting other people in the city, which is fascinating for when there's so much else going on, everyone's answer is still it's the people, which is yeah. Great. I love the I love that. I might steal that Flynn. That was that Thanks. was great. I'm gonna use that in my presentations now. <laughs> but it's Perfect. true. Like you know, a lot of families, they'll come visit and they're worried about the party reputation or that their kid's going to be on Bourbon Street every weekend and this and that. But the things with New Orleans that, that make it interesting and cultural require zero alcohol to be fun. That's the thing. It's like you don't need to drink to enjoy Mardi Gras or all the festivals I mentioned or going to concerts at Champion Square or Wednesdays at the Square or whatever. Like there's just so much happening that it's just it's more exciting than most places. And I'm never going to apologize for that, you know. Yeah, I feel like that sense of community would be so helpful, too, because I don't know about y'all, but when I was in my first year of college, I remember distinctly thinking, oh, my God, this is so much lonelier and harder than I thought it was going to be. Like Nobody talks about this part of the college experience. And I, I have to think that going to school in New Orleans, where it is such a community based culture, has to help out with that in some some sense. I'd I'd completely agree. You know, it it gives you opportunities to socialize and do things in an environment that feels exciting and warm, but also not like super intimidating from a making friends standpoint. You know, it's not you're asking someone to like go to dinner and a movie or whatever, like you're just going out and hanging out. And it's more of those like shoulder to shoulder activities where you're sharing something and taking it in and you can talk about it. But if the vibe isn't right with the person you're trying to get introduced to, like, it's okay. You're still doing something cool and you can enjoy it for yourself as well. So yeah, it's definitely atypical for freshmen. You know, you're not just going to frat parties and tailgates and that's all you have to do. It's like got all these other elements of your social life as well. So funny to hear tailgates as a too late thing. I know. We're football school now, Glenn. It's very different from when you were here. (laughs) I I was in the marching band. So I have, I performed Mm. at the dome, um, but it's so great to see 
more than dozens of students. So I'm very right. jealous of the experience you get to have now. Yeah, it's very different than the Dome. I Yeoman didn't open until after I graduated, but it's just night and day compared to a game day at the Superdome now. It's it's fantastic. It's really, really cool. All right, well, well Tulane's obviously one thing in admissions and, and social media, but we, while we, we have you, we might as well ask, what made you want to go on Survivor? What was your favorite challenge? How'd you enjoy it? With Survivor, that's a show that I fell in love with as a kid. You know, it came out in 2000, 2001. I was eight or nine years old when it started, and I just was caught up by it. I just thought mm -hmm. it was so cool, and the challenges, and the swimming, and I didn't understand the social strategy side of it at all. But once I got older and started appreciating the show more, I became obsessed. I binge watched every season. I dove into the fandom. I started listening to podcasts and I started feeling like I could actually do it. And I was very fortunate that I was able to and the timing lined up with my work schedule and whatnot. But it was just an incredible experience getting to be on my favorite show, getting to go live on a beach in Fiji. And the challenges were super cool. I was so honored that I got to participate in my favorite challenge, which is called Last Gasp. It's the one where there's a grate over your face in the ocean and the tide is coming in. And uh, my cat, Nate Carla, and I actually both, we tied and won that challenge because we outlasted the tide. We were in there for almost three hours. And at certain points, we were holding our breath underwater for 45 seconds, a minute, probably. And it was just uh, an out-of-body experience. Very, very cool. And I, I did better than I thought I would. I ended up winning three individual immunity challenges, which is a healthy amount for one person to win in a season. And that was an element of my game that I didn't expect to be like the best of mine. Like my strategic game was worse than I expected. My physical game was better than I expected. And it was just, it was a dream come true. And it was, it was incredible. And it's just been so fun to be a part of that community now also. It, it must be an incredible, just for your favorite thing to be. The time I couldn't breathe for upwards of a minute. <laughs> like, <laughs> Just shows how, how unique of an experience that really must have been. Very, yeah. very. It was it was something else. I have a logistical question. How long is the actual filming process? Like how how long did you have to take off work? Yeah. <laughs> so post COVID, they shortened the game from thirty nine to twenty six days. That's in part because in twenty twenty one, I guess when it resumed, they had a fourteen day quarantine period. For us, the quarantine was about five days. So we did a few days in LA. And then a few days in Fiji when we did our preseason interviews and the, the pictures and all of that. And then the game was 26 days. And then we left the day after final tribal council. So I was gone, I think, for about five weeks total. So it was manageable. It was mostly during May, which in the admission world is a perfect time to, to be gone since May 1st is the enrollment deadline at most places. So that was really fortuitous timing. And it wasn't too bad. Uh, Tulane was great about letting me take the time. Thanks. Um, I feel Survivor is such an interesting vacuum of a show because it's all these people that are put in this remote place. I mean, I know there's crews there and stuff, but remote and all of these like interesting human behavioral stuff starts to come out. And that strategy part of it, like you were saying, is so fascinating to me. I and mean, I'm wondering what part of Survivor do you feel like you've taken into your current role, if you have at all? Like, lessons learned, skills. That's a super interesting question. I think I learned a lot from the show and it's been interesting trying to like weave it back into my life without falling back into my old habits. Cause coming back from the show, you feel a total fish out of water and it's so strange. Like final tribal council was a Friday and I was back at work on a Tuesday. Like it was a very quick turnaround. And there were moments where I was like, what am I doing? Why am I not like living in a van in a national park? Like, what is this? But I think one of the biggest lessons I learned is not to take people at face value and really to try to understand their motivations and their backstory and uh, their desires for, you know, your relationship and what they're looking for in life or the game or whatever. And I think it's easy to make assumptions about people in higher education, you know, about what kind of institution they work at or like what's the endowment of the school they, they are looking at or, you know, you, it's easy to put people into categories or institutions into categories and, and make judgments. And so I think I've been able to slow down and really focus on the one-to-one -one relationships in my life and in, in business as well, and really trying to approach vendors or people we're partnered with in a more human way rather than just a transactional way. 
I think that has helped me as I've moved into this new role and I manage a lot of those relationships more now, I'm really getting to know the reps and the people I'm working with one-on-one -on -one to be able to find opportunities that are mutually beneficial for Tulane and their company, I think has allowed us to do business better and come up with more creative ideas. Um, I think the strategy of it, something I struggled with in the game was liking a step back and seeing the whole picture, whether that was doing a puzzle or thinking about the game. For those that didn't watch season 43, the short version is basically I was kind of on the outs for most of the game and I was constantly scrambling to stay alive. I had to win some challenges. And so I couldn't like unlock that next level of strategy because a lot of the times my main priority was just simply not getting voted out. And I couldn't really like think further than that. Um, but now having the hindsight and watching it and thinking now how that applies to real life, I think I'm able more now to delve a layer deeper and understand the big picture and try to see how certain interactions or certain ideas or campaigns or emails or whatever can be part of the bigger picture strategy and understanding the whole board a little bit better. And that, that's been fun for me now that I oversee print and email in concert with social media. And I'm not just in that single silo with social media. I'm understanding now how the parts fit together and they can complement each other better. You did very well. You say that you didn't get very far. You made it to the final tribal council. Like you got it. That is true. That is true. I did get third. I did get third, but uh, yeah, it's uh, wasn't going to win. But that's okay. I still have fun. Wait till they bring you back. Yeah, we'll see. Knock on wood. Yeah, I had a triple not getting hurt feelings during the tribal councils. Councils, and you, you know, it, it was hard. I mean, I got into a shouting match with someone. Like it's, it is hard to separate the emotions. As much as you want to say it's just a game. <laughs> You know, it's it's your dream, and it's a million dollars. Like that's it's life changing. So yeah, it was it was hard to not make it personal, but fortunately, my cast are all like very cool down there people. So it's it was easy to forgive them. Cool. So you were a Tulane student, and you're now working for Tulane. How do you feel that your time as an experience as a student has helped you run admissions or run the communications? Yeah, I mean, I I don't. This might sound a little mean, but I don't understand how anyone can do this not at their alma mater. Like, I, I think, I mean, certainly people can and they can understand and learn the culture of the institution. But for me, my experiences just shape it so much. And I can just think back to how I felt, right? Like so much. I always constantly think about the quote. It's like, you won't remember what they said, but you'll remember how they made you feel. And my experience with Tulane, it's all about how I felt and how I felt welcomed and how I felt like I was never sp the smartest person in a room, but the other people trying to lift you up rather than put you down. Feeling what it was like at your first Mardi Gras and at your first festival and trying your first po' boy, like those things, those experiences I've had, I don't think can be replicated by someone just coming in and saying, okay, let's write copy for an email. Um, so I think I'm fortunate that that is how my brain operates, but then also the institution and the office allow us to focus on storytelling and wants us to focus on storytelling and not just spit statistics at students and say, okay, we have X amount of labs and X amount of majors. Like it's really about what the four year lived experience can be like. And being someone that did that, like it's, it's a lot to explain. There's a lot of different layers to it. And it's, it gives us almost endless possibilities. Of, okay. This festival is coming up. Maybe we can run a campaign about that oh, we've got this big speaker series coming to campus. Let's talk about that. Um, it's thesis time and all the seniors are presenting their research. It's time to talk about that. So we've got a lot of different facets that we can explore. And it, it's made it very fun and kind of contributes to the whole cyclical nature of how admissions is. It allows me to, to work on campaigns and ideas uh, based on what's going on in the city and on campus. Yeah, you mentioned storytelling um, and how that is a big component to your role. How do you think that the storytelling is within the context of a place like New Orleans, as we were just saying, is like so unique? How do you think that that storytelling is shaped by not only the culture, but like the, the geographical content context as well? Yeah, it's it's integral, in my opinion. I, I really think the the spirit of New Orleans is so much in the Tulane experience, right? Like Tulane at surface level kind of feels like and looks like a, a campus in the Northeast, right? Like we get a lot of students from New York and California and Chicago and all over the country. And 
it's a private institution. It costs a lot of money to go there. Like there's a lot of things that on paper would make it feel like somewhere else, but then you plop it in uptown New Orleans and you, you can't help but have that, that looseness of the city and the go with the flow attitude and just like the more chill approach to life, like that really bleeds into campus. And so trying to explain that is a really fun challenge where, you know, yes, we're a reputable institution and we're known for having some really top flight programs in certain departments and things of that nature. But then just trying to capture the the essence of the city and the way that you feel on campus is really, I think, hugely important to, to our marketing and to our brand, because I think that's part of what students are looking for, right? Is that they want that top flight education. They want access to great professors that have terminal degrees and that small student to faculty ratio, but they want to enjoy their life while they're there. Like something I say to students all the time is like, it doesn't matter how highly ranked someone's neuroscience program is if you hate your life while you're studying in that program, right? Like you want to be happy on campus. And New Orleans, in my opinion, is a hard place to not be happy. Yeah. That that should be the taglines that you use. Yeah. <laughs> I think also Tulane's always because they always that you have to do. It's a weird thing. I want to be like you have to do volunteer. So it's not really volunteer, but it they do a good job of having you do community engagement mm-hmm. before you graduate. Even which it's kind of an odd thing. You go to college, you're like, oh, I'm here to study, and no, 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 you're here to engage with the community that you've now moved to because there's mm-hmm. a lot of. And I've always thought that's been really helpful at accomplishing everything you said where they're not just moving for their for the education they're they're moving to grow a community i think yeah a great I'm, job. Re- I'm really glad you mentioned that Flynn, because the service requirement to some people it you know they're like it's required this and that and like that's a great sign that you shouldn't come here if that's yeah. something <laughs> that makes you you know give, gives pause to someone but for us i think Tulane does a very good job of partnering with things that are already going on in the city. You know, we partner with, I think it's about 600 local organizations and students are coming in and joining work that's already going on. And it feels a lot less ivory tower. Um, I know certainly that is Tulane's reputation to a degree, which is fair. We are PWI a predominantly black city. We've got this high price tag, all of that. But I think Tulane is very intentional about our students, not just swooping in and throwing money around and pretending that they're some hero, right? They really want them to build meaningful relationships and do service in a way that feels real and meaningful to them. And I I think that allows our students to get out of the two-lane bubble and to find something that's impactful and is kind of mutually beneficial. And it, it feels to me, it gives students a new perspective on service and that it's not all just about money or going on a service trip to Costa Rica or whatever. It's like you can do things in your own backyard that have a direct impact on people and are fun for you as well. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a really, I think, powerful part of the experience. Yeah, absolutely. So, so going more into the marketing side of things, obviously young people, they, they tell me are, are savvy. We <laughs> met them on the other day. We started talking about targeting older individuals, millennials. And I, 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 I yeah, it hurts. There was Brutal. a physical pain. <laughs> but since you are targeting, it's just your back going out. <laughs> since you are targeting younger, you know, you said high school juniors and seniors, how do you effectively gauge with that more tech savvy, younger, younger dem- demographics while still maintaining the integrity and and reputation of an organization that's been around for hundreds of years? Yeah, fantastic question. I think the Gen Zers, are, are, they, are they Gen Alpha now? No, I think the high schoolers are still Gen Z. They have very good BS detectors, in my opinion. Like, I, I think they can understand when a brand is trying to, you know, how do you do fellow kids them? <laughs> and they, they want authenticity. They want realness. They want you to meet them where they are. And I think that's been a big part of our success with our virtual events since the pandemic started, with utilizing social media, TikTok, and not trying to. Like, that's one of the things that I struggle with the most is kind of threading the needle to where we are in those spaces, but it feels like we're not invading those spaces, right? We're trying to get our message across in a authentic but truthful way where we're not trying too hard, we're not trying to oversell, and we're trying to use not necessarily the language, you know, we're not saying, oh, Tulane has the Riz or whatever, but we're like, we're trying to get those themes across in a, in a digestible way for the students. And, and they're smart. You said they're very on top of it and you don't need to spoon feed them. But I think 
kind of not taking ourselves too seriously is one of the things we're known for as an institution and in our office. And I know certain people, some may take umbrance with that sometimes, but I think overall, like, we don't have to pretend that we're, you know, a, a number one ranked school in the country. We can understand that hey, this is a really, really great place to get an education. We have great programs. We have great faculty, but you're allowed to have fun here as well. And um, I think they appreciate that. You know, these students are really um, depressed and depressed and have gone through a lot in their in their short time. You know, thinking about starting high school in the middle of the pandemic and getting eighth grade cut short and then having to start high school virtually. And, you know, it's just a strange time. And they haven't had some of those same benchmarks that we had growing up. And they've dealt with just a little bit of a bleaker outlook on the world, I think. And so getting to highlight some of the, the aspects that will allow them to relax and have fun and enjoy themselves in college while still getting the education that they want and that their parents want, and that will open doors for them for years from now, I think is really crucial too. Yeah, I'm curious, you mentioned that not trying too hard. And I think that's one of the bigger challenges that have really taken off in the last five years. And TikTok is to blame and to think for that is you can now make mistakes. You could be a lot more informal is a lot that should look unplanned, but you are someone who obviously works very hard. And how do you feel that it truly isn't trying too hard or it just happens? Or do you think that there's a lot of behind the scenes work to give you that sort of personal feel? That's a good one. I think it's a bit of both. I mean, and I, I th I'm sure there are students out there that says Tulane does try too hard with the amount of emails that we send and that the emojis we use in our subject lines on emails and things like that. Like, I'm sure there are some people that roll their eyes at us for sure. But like my philosophy, like I haven't posted on TikTok in a while because I don't want to force it. I don't want to do some dance just because it's trending and it has nothing to do with us, right? I want to try to express our brand and convey the messaging that I'm trying to convey in a way that feels real and not too forced and still gets the message across. You know, it would be <laughs> weird to shoehorn in two lane statistics while you're doing a trending dance or whatever, right? Like you, you really yeah. want to be intentional about what you're doing. And I think sometimes people panic and feel like they have to be in that space and we must do this. But I, I think posting too frequently or, or doing a trend poorly is almost worse than not doing it at all. Particularly on TikTok, I'd rather just pop up every now and then with something good and informative and that is relevant to the zeitgeist on TikTok, but then also relevant to us rather than like posting every single day, like feeling desperate. Um, so it does take some thought and some planning. And I think it is constantly like, trying to find the right chemistry there and, and figuring out if we're doing too much or too little. I think that is one of the biggest challenges I face. And it's it can be a struggle at times just trying to understand like, oh, are we tweeting enough? Or like, where are the parents living right now? Like that sort of thing. But for my priority has always been the students. And I, I think as long as they feel like we are relatable and in their corner and approachable, maybe even approachable more than relatable is, is the most important thing. Like, I don't want to be, I don't want students to be scared of reaching out to their admission counselor. I want them to feel comfortable calling our office, asking the question, reaching out to our interns and feeling like that they can be helped by our staff. I think it goes back to what you said earlier. Like you want to be a big sibling and a, a good no. big sibling isn't your best friend and taking you to their parties. They are they are watching <laughs> over you and helping you go to your own parties and like giving you tips on how to have fun. And that that's approachable. Like that's what you want. Yeah. I love that analogy. That's perfect. Yeah. That we're we're just trying to guide them and help them prevent prevent help them prevent making the same mistakes that I made in the college search. And I want them to be even more successful than I was and less stressed than I was and happier than I was while they go through their search. You did a good job. You ended up at Tulane. Yeah, exactly. It worked out okay. But I want them to have every option they want. It sounds like there's a great deal of strategy when it comes to resonating with prospective students from the type back to survivor. Do you feel like any of the survivor strategy translates to communicating with prospective students and how, how you do that? Good question. I think, yeah, a lot of what I've learned is how you have to approach each conversation differently. And and it goes back to what I was saying a bit earlier about understanding people people's motivations and what they're looking for and what actions they want to take and what they don't want to do. 
and understanding that every audience is different. You know, even just the way we approach our freshman and sophomore marketing versus our junior marketing, things like that. You know, understanding where they're at in the process on their own journey and inserting our, our, ourselves in a way that feels again approachable to where we're not forcing it. And it is it is challenging, but I I think the show did teach me a lot. I had a 19 year old on my tribe, and then I also had the oldest member of our cast on my tribe. He was I think 51 at the right. time of filming. So we had quite an age range in our group and understanding like how to speak to them and what they were looking for and who like how to play into their own ego and their impression of themselves. I think is really important with these students too, because you have some of these students who are, you know, Tulane is their pie in the sky dream. They really want to be here. It's the school they've wanted to go to since they were a baby versus, you know, you have students who are applying to the Ivy League and Stanford and all these, you know, top flight, most prestigious institutions. And we're trying to show them what we've got to offer them because they're so amazing. And so I'm just trying to do that calculus and figure out how to approach each population, I think, has been uh, a valuable exercise that I got to practice on the show, too. And I'll say, like, the show is obviously a group game. It's a team game. And you are now a team. You're working with, a, you have staff, you have interns, as you said. How do you feel that, that experience on Survivor really shaped your perspective on teamwork and leadership? And how do you apply that to what you're doing now? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I would consider myself a leader in my professional life. You know, I, I try to serve as a mentor to a lot of our student workers and empower them to do their own thing. And I did not emerge as a leader on, on the show. I didn't necessarily want to because I think it's a very different situation because if you're a bad leader, they can just vote you out. You know, they, <laughs> they can't do that at work. But I, I think a lot of the lessons I was just talking about, about understanding people's impressions of themselves and how they see themselves in, in an alliance, understanding who wants to be the shot caller, who wants to take the reins and not being too much and not fighting for that power, I think is something that you need to try to figure out. And on the show, I miscalculated. I ended up coasting a little bit too much and not wanting to make too much of a splash. And then by the time I needed to, I wasn't able to take the driver's seat. Whereas at work, I think I... I'm the kind of manager that is not overbearing. I trust my team a lot. I, I judge them based on the work that they do and how they approach it. And I, I don't, I'm not as concerned about the day to day minutia, right? If someone needs to pick up their kid from daycare and, you know, might be offline for a couple hours, I'm not like a stickler about that. And I, I, I want them to be able to feel supported and that I trust them, right? So I think trust is is a currency that we talk about on Survivor a lot. And I think in the workplace, it is really important. And I think it leads people to want to work harder if they feel like that you value them and, they're, and you trust them and that you let them, let their work speak for itself. So I, I try to approach my team that way. And I'm very lucky that I have some supremely talented people on my team that I, I don't feel like I have to micromanage. It's it's fantastic. Yeah, and that level of like trust and that respect for each other that you even seem to have for your staff is, I, I think, always the mark of a great manager. That that trust That's doesn't right. just it's it's not just good employees. It comes from the relationship that you've built with them. Thank you. I I try. I really do. Yeah, and moving through challenges with them, I'm sure. Which the survivor challenges. I don't know about you all, but I find them to be so incredibly stressful just to watch. <laughs> <laughs> and you were well. Two questions. When when you were doing the challenges, were you as stressed out as probably some of the viewers were? And then two, do you have a favorite challenge that like just you remember in your head and you're like, that was good? I was not super stressed out. I was usually pretty hyped up going into a challenge. I used to row competitively in high school. I played football in high school. I was terrible at football, but I was still on the team. But I, I was talking about this with Sammy from my tribe who also played football and like it was really the first team experience that I had had since school. You know, your intramural flag football team at Tulane doesn't bring out the same like competitive energy that a team sport in high school or a survivor challenge does. So those those were really, really fun. You just so much adrenaline. It is stressful because, you know, the stakes are quite high, but I had a blast. Um, for challenges, last gasp is up there, you know, drowning in the ocean. But besides that one, I really did enjoy the team ones. 
in particular, the one from our third episode, it's called Turtle Head, if you want to look it up on YouTube, but um, it involved diving off of this giant structure into the ocean, diving down to get a key, and then we had a puzzle at the end, and it was just quintessential Survivor to me. Like, I'd always wanted to jump off a, a tie tower into the ocean on Survivor. Like, that was like what I wanted to do when I was nine years old, and to get to do that and watch my my team crush the puzzle after we did the swimming leg and we were first the whole challenge like that was a really fun like team bonding moment for sure the little boy tends to company retreat bonding situation yes <laughs> exactly god we've had some rough bonding exercises over the years <laughs> we've done blindfold ones we've done all sorts of goofy stuff and yeah like it's just it's not the same you can't capture that energy Tulane has a high dive board. I think you could. I don't know if liability wise you could. (laughs) Yeah, diving boards freak me out a little bit. I'm not going to lie. At least this one was like wood and stable and not bouncy. Well, I think that about wraps it up for us. Um, Thank you so much for coming on the show. We do to give our guests just a moment at the end to plug themselves where they work whatever you want to kind of put on spotlight now's your time yeah thank thank you for letting me um, so our channels for work it's only at tulane on instagram and on tiktok um, you know if you want to get some great videos about new orleans and tulane's life we we try to do that and convey all that messaging we were talking about and then if you want to follow me i'm, I'm mostly active on instagram which is the young knight uh, Young is my middle name so i was very proud of that handle um, <laughs> but yeah this was really fun i appreciate y'all's questions and it's always fun to try to like think about survivor in the context of work i don't get to do that when i go on survivor podcasts so it's it's it was a fun exercise i appreciate y'all having me awesome you're, you're our first survivor guest so we're, we appreciate the opportunity <laughs> to do that yeah. <laughs> all right, thank you, Owen. Thank, thank you. you all. Bye. Thanks for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe and rate the podcast. And if there's anything you'd like to hear us discuss, reach out on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn. And as always, stay optimistic.